Hey, welcome to another edition of Radio Friends again. And uh, we've got, uh, let's see, what do we got? The 16th of February, 2024. And um, we've got a uh, special guest with us, Dave. That we got uh, Dave via um, iPhone right now. And uh, going around the room a little bit, if I miss you, let me know. I'm Steve Parker. Uh, Claudia Feeney is with us. We've got uh, Dick Colt. Uh, Dick just had a check out. Ed Mitchell, Ron Pell, uh, Bob Craig, uh, Bob Marks, uh, Ed Bruder, uh, Jim Harrington's over there. Uh, John Landry, Pete Salant, Ted Dalicu, Tracy Carmen, Greg Simonson, Lee Gordon. Uh, I think if I've got everybody, did I get everybody? Okay. Claudia. I think, yep, there's Claudia. I got everybody here. All right. So, yeah. So uh, we were just uh, talking a little bit about the biz. And, uh, and uh, go ahead, everybody. Let's let's do this. Let's go um, around the room. If you want to, uh, John Landry, if you want to say good morning. Good morning, John Landry. <laughs> good morning, John. If, you, if you could say where you're, uh, where you're coming from. So, John? I'm coming from cloudy Middletown, Connecticut. All right, Bob Craig. Yeah, as usual here in Philly, it's, uh, what, 36 degrees? And we have sunshine, expecting one to three inches of snow. <laughs> Ed Bruder is with us. I'm in Manchester, New Hampshire. I'm a, a DRC alum of about the two months from way back when. <laughs> and Claudia, I guess I don't know what we're going with. Claudia Feeney, Claudia Bernstein. Claudia, Claudia Bernstein. Claudia. Claudia. <laughs> Claudia. Hi, Lee. Hi, Claudia. Uh, w originally, first WPOP Magic 104 when Merv Griffin was in control. WDRC when Ron Pell was in control. <laughs> Don't blame me. <laughs> <laughs> and Fox 61 and then Media Vine. Uh, right. where, where Lee Gordon when we got the ink. <laughs> where were you, where are you today, Claudia? Uh South Windsor. Okay. Uh let's see. We've got uh Ron Pell. Ron. Good morning from sunny, cloudy, low 30s Meriden for two more weeks, and then I'm out of here. Why? I'm no, moving to back to I'm moving back to Cheshire. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm but building a house and it's not ready yet. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, we've got uh, Lee Gordon. Lee, where are you coming to us from today? I'm uh, I'm coming from, uh, as you can see from the picture, I'm coming from uh, beautiful uh, downtown uh, Boynton Beach, uh, Florida, where it's uh, it's uh, partly cloudy and a a, a balmy seventy three degrees. Um, nice. And uh, Ted Dalek was with us. I'm on the other coast of Florida, down in Venice, and it's a also one of those partly sunny, partly cloudy days. It's going to be in the mid seventies, but seventy six or so. Golf yesterday, you know, and motorcycle riding tomorrow, so we're good. Greg Simon, Greg Simonson looks like he's uh, nice and toasty today. Which I need to be because it's not exactly warm here in Northampton, Massachusetts, where I generally always report from. Um, I um, got to know so many of the people in this group from my short days. At, well, I was on the air at 91Q, and EX. I was pretty much the low end of the on the air. Uh, talent pool. I'd be the, the person you'd call when the person that you really wanted to come in couldn't come in. But I still had a lot of fun with those with those years. Uh, and, then, and, then, and then jumped into sales and I had a lot of fun with uh, my days at Kiss FM and at CRM. Hey there, Dick. And there's Dick Koff. Hi, Dick. He's still here with us. I am. I'm about to leave. I'm here in sunny Westport. It's 81 degrees under the geodesic dome. Because, uh -huh. uh, you know, in Westport, we can have one of those. <laughs> but it's really, you know, cold and windy. And uh, but it's a pleasure to be with everybody. And uh, I'm going to have to run. And I'm looking forward to uh, connecting um, with everybody next week. But thank you for your patience and have a wonderful weekend. Take care, guys. Thanks, yeah. you, Dick. Thanks, Thanks Dick. I see uh, Tracy Carmen is here, another Supreme Archivist. Yeah, live and direct from West Palm Beach, uh, right up the road from uh, Lee Gordon, who I had lunch with earlier this week. Getting ready to blast back to Longmeadow, Mass uh, tomorrow. Uh, to, my kids are complaining, walking across the campus of UMass up in Amherst at me this morning as I'm showing them pictures of uh, palm trees with my phone and getting all sorts of uh, uh, expressions that shouldn't be repeated here in response. 
I think and, I, the only reason, and the only reason I'm here is I took a left turn at Albuquerque. I never really fully. Uh, <laughs> so, Dave, did you did you get most of these guys okay? Uh, I'm listening and, and really enjoying really enjoying it. I'm down here in Kilgore, Texas, <laughs> Lake Kilgore, and just moved here to be alone, and I'm very alone. And uh, anyway, I'm, I'm really enjoying this very, very neat sound. Well, I tell you, it's uh, it's something we started back, um, oh, I don't know, about a year and a half ago. And uh, Ron and I, Ron Pell and I started doing uh, DRC reunions pretty much without the radio station back in 2010. Because Give uh, Lee some credit, Steve. Huh? Give Lee some credit. He really oh, started it with the POP. If Lee Lee actually started before us with the POP reunion, yes. and then we were able to uh, meld them all together. Um, but um, then we started uh, meeting on Zoom calls back with, uh, we were putting the 100 together for DRC. And we just had so much damn fun. We said, we'll just see who keeps gathering on Friday morning. So that's that's all we really do. Hey, Tracy, um, I, uh, you're down in you're down in Florida, and you got a lot of uh, a, a lot of a uh, uh, techie stuff behind you. If you could, because um, you don't have to, you took us around already. Can you give uh, Dave a, a little bit of a uh, theater of the mind of what you've got there in your room with you? <laughs> this is this is the lay of the time for God. Uh, my, my my friend of fifty years, uh, Chuck Hurley, he passed away. And I'm sitting in uh, what was the first floor bedroom here, and he collected all sorts of stuff. There are Pacific recorder consoles. There are McCurdy consoles and sub consoles. There's a full studio in one of the bedrooms upstairs set up and ready to roll. Uh, there are enough cart machines here to uh, power the iHeart na uh, network before they go out of business. <laughs> uh, just tons and tons of equipment, microphones, uh I was going to sit in front of the, he has got a stack of uh, cubes, radio station cubes that go on the mics. I was going to sit in front of that this morning for grins. And this is just packed with stuff and we're starting to sort through and sell off some of the stuff and try to clean out. Uh, you know, again, I'm looking at a Gentner uh, hybrid here in front of me. I'm looking at uh, con controllers for a TK760 RCA camera. There's a full camera upstairs tv camera uh the, the, the computer's resting on top of a marty unit um, i mean just tons of stuff so so dave um how many years ago dave did you retire and what was it that brought you into retirement well what brought me into retirement was uh kind of taller <laughs> i'm in with taller brought me into retirement um he said, go away. Um, I, I've been there for 20 years. And yeah, that's a long time. That's what the, the length of time is uh, available. And it's been three to five years. And I stayed for 20. So, hell, I, uh, I had a good time. A good time. All right. So now we are recording here. So how about uh, how about bringing us some of those good times? You dealt with a lot of artists, and you you sure as hell dealt with a right a lot of radio stations and uh, PDs and music directors and everything else. So um, yeah, I think the picture I have of you uh, maybe backstage at the Bushnell. I think possibly blood, sweat, and tears with Barry Grant. Does that sound right? Oh wow! Yeah, it, yes, it is. That's when that was. Uh... Uh, what was the lead singer's name? David Clayton Thomas? Yes. Uh, yeah. he, he was, yep. he, somebody else was filling in that night. I don't recall who, his, who it was. It was fun. Um, it's, 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 I'm flashing on. Um, I'm on the live front. Oh. Uh, no, Claudia, so, yeah, uh, just, Claudia, were you trying to say something or do you want to mute? No. I'm I'm good. Yeah. Okay. So and so Dave, I mean, this was like the the heyday of the uh, of the reps. I mean, God only knows what was happening backstage and everything else. Who were some of the um who was who was some of the talent you dealt with, Dave? You know, it's it's uh, there's so much for me to talk about because I was I was the promotion man during a period. I I could do no wrong. I had both Columbia and Epic 
I couldn't, I could barely go into a radio station without get, getting something in. Is I had nothing to do with it. They're just good music, and um, they, that's that's really all I have to say. It's it's there was a great period, wonderful times. Now, do you, are there other are there other um, promo guys, other record reps, uh, Dave, that really stand out in your mind? Because obviously they were friends and probably some competitors. So, who are some of the guys that you remember dealing with, maybe from the other labels? Well, let's do it. Bob Piva from P.O.P. Oh, Bob Piva, yep. Ken Griffin. Oh. John. Is Ken still alive? Ken Griffin, I think, died um, back a few years ago. Oh, my. Yeah. Uh, yes. But um, we had Joey Reynolds on with us the other day. And, of course, he was around there with Kenny. Um, Dick Robinson is still alive and well and uh, living in Farmington. He's going to be, I think, 85 or 86. And he's doing okay. But uh, it's, it's, it's amazing the fact that, you know, with when you dealt, did you deal with any of the guys like uh from the other labels or or know of them like Jay Miggins and um like uh a, Merv Amal, Merv Amal. Some of those guys? Yeah, well, with them, I, I remember Merv Amal. You know, Merv is uh, I'll never forget the time I, I walked out of DRC with three, I got three records of it, and Merv was gonna kill me because he gets three J. Because he couldn't get get on what he had to get on. Um, oh well, so be it. <laughs> who who would you say though back then? I mean, Merv was a pretty colorful character. What about some of the other guys you might remember? You know something, I really don't remember any of the names. I'm serious. I don't remember the name. Remember, I remember Merv, but yep. he's the one. Well, but what was it? Uh... Really, uh, what was it that, uh, Dave, that made you want to get into that business? I was hitchhiking. Uh, I had left the Marine, the Marine Corps, and I was hitchhiking, and I got, oh, God, that's such a long story, and the uh, guy picked me up and gave me a job. <laughs> he needed somebody. I started in a, with a rack jumper, if anybody knows what that oh, was. Yeah, yeah. I uh, stayed there for a while and couldn't do job for Columbia. Came over and I came up and there it was. Tossed. And then he had some great work. artists back then, didn't he? He had, he had like uh, um, Chicago was on Columbia. I think, Paul Simon uh, I think was. David Paul Chase uh, and Ch I mean, the group Chase, I yeah. think they were on Epic. I mean, he, I, I, he had a ton of great artists on. Uh, on his label. Okay. Yeah, you yeah, had Springsteen. Yeah. Having a card. It was the thing. I couldn't Perfect. do any wrong. I couldn't. Uh, whatever records are, <laughs> I would bring. I would bring in. I would just give to the give to people they put <laughs> on. It's it's like so much for the promotion, man. You know, I really felt bad for. Those, I really felt bad for those guys who were hustling hustling music, but. They, they couldn't get any single, anything on. Dave, did you go back was, long enough? To, did you work at all with Bertha Porter at DRC? Oh, good. Oh, I took Bertha to a, um, a function one time one night. She needed a ride. Good old Bertha. Yes, yes that was when I started. I I. I can't even remember who else. Pardon me, I don't have any teeth. Uh, <laughs> um, I can't remember who else was on the radio um, back then. So, so now, um, what was? Were you? Uh, did you also rep uh, Springsteen? Did I what? Did you have? Did you have Springsteen as a talent? Bruce Springsteen. Bruce? I just wondered, uh, Dave, if you had Bruce Springsteen back then, if that was one of the uh, one of the guys that you represented, Bruce Springsteen. Bruce Bruce was here. Uh, I remember I remember when he was at the University of Hartford, 
performing, and somebody made a mistake of putting up the uh, <laughs> the dance hall glitz, the glitzes, the ball. I, I didn't expect to do this to do this this morning. Um, so, hey, Dave, you're, my... you're doing fine. Dave, you're 84 years old. That's that's why that's why a lot of us uh, get together every week to do this because it really. Uh, Pete Salant uh, <laughs> said a long time ago that by doing this on a weekly basis, his wife uh, is a psychologist, and so isn't uh, Pete, and that it's important to kind of like you know blow off the uh, the terminals on the batteries. And by doing this weekly, it's amazing how many things come back. And um, really, Dave, well, even if you just listen in, um, it really is. It, it 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 saves off Alzheimer's. It helps you keep your shit together. And uh, when we ever heard this was something healthy to do, Dave. Shock the shit out of us because we've been just and a lot of guys, Dave, believe it or not, just come on and listen in. Um, it just uh it really helps a lot. I think what I'm going to do is write some things down during during the week. That's all. No, good. I mean, um, and then if you want to um, we can work out the techie stuff, Dave. And um, I'm sure during the week we can do some stuff. We got some really good techie guys here. We can walk you through it. Do you have access? To a computer, or is it we're going to be able to do it through the phone? Well, it's fine. I didn't anticipate doing this this morning. It's uh, for certain. Uh, I listen. Um, I gotta go. Okay. Uh, no, I really do have to leave, and I'm just saying that I'm enjoy I am enjoying this so much. I can't tell you. Um, I got. I'm here alone with my dad's and. Just, just staring at me, wondering what the hell's going on. So I have to go. Thank you very much, everybody. You're just a joy. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you, Dave. And it's like, uh, you know, just I was happy that we were able to to, uh, to de connect Dick Caught with you because he's, uh, he's, he's great and he's been really anxious to talk to you because of the PLR stuff that's coming up. But also, um, really, uh, we'll, we'll help you techie during the week. And I, I really think that you'll uh, you'll enjoy it, even if you just do this and come in and listen in. And uh, you'll be surprised some of the things you will remember by hanging out with us and probably some of the stuff you wish you could forget. For sure. <laughs> For sure. Listen, thanks, everybody. Hey, Have thank you, day. Dave. Thank, and, thanks Dave. For, and thanks, Dave, for everybody say goodbye, Dave. Bye, Dave. Bye, Dave. Bye, Dave. Bye, Dave. Bye, Dave. Bye, Dave. <laughs> All right, we'll catch you next time, Dave. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I I apologize. It is a little tricky, but how cool is it? He's eighty four years old. He's living in Texas by himself. Shit, man, this is the kind of reason we do this kind of stuff. So uh, hopefully we can help him out techie wise uh, during the uh, during the week. What else is going on, guys? Well, since we're talking about music, maybe we can get Ed Mitchell to turn around and tell us what the labels are on his gold records back there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um... I don't know how to point. Let me see if I can get a pointer of some kind here. Probably not. That's uh, Tim McGraw, Cindy Lauper, Michael Buble. The guitar is Winona. That's a pretty good variety. Uh, then I got uh, Mercy Me, Whitney, and Journey. Very nice. Very nice. Pretty. And then over, wait a minute. Oh, wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. <laughs> but wait, there's more there's if I can more. get to it. Yeah, up in that corner there. Let me figure it out. The lamp's kind of in the way. Let me unplug this. We got a lamp from though, Bob's Ed. Discount Furniture. <laughs> that's Wilson. Uh, that's, um, oh, uh, the bottom one is Wilson Phillips. And the top one is one of the very few gold records ever issued for Phil Collins against all odds. Ooh. Um, yeah. I was uh Sam, anybody remember a guy named Sam Kaiser? No. no. Sam Kaiser was a big guy with Atlantic at the time. And uh I got hold of this uh single back in the days of of records called Against All Odds by Phil Collins, of course. Oh yeah. And I heard that song and I just said to myself, Oh my god, this is a smash. It's the summer ballad that we're all looking for. So I called up the Atlantic rep, Sam. And I said, Sam, you got a smash on your hands. He said, which one? I told him, he says, we're not even going to work that record. It was just obligatory from, from, the, from the contract for the soundtrack to the movie. I said, trust me, work it. 
And of course, it went up to number one. So I actually got one of the few gold records that were ever issued for that because I was the guy that said, hey, you might want to give this a look. Cool. Um, Great so the story behind the Mercy Me is I was the first, um, what is it called, Bob, when you're not a religious station? Sectarian or non-sectarian? I always get the two confused. Secular, secular station. I was a heathen radio programmer, and um, <laughs> popped, uh, I heard Mercy Me for the first time, having no idea that it was a Christian-based song. It was just a, a beautiful song and lyric. So I popped it on the air on a soft rock in uh, San Antonio, and of course that song went on to be a big hit too, so they were kind enough to give me a, a gold record for that. And then when I met the group, they were a bunch of dicks, so... <laughs> I, I mean you're looking at the program director that put it on a mass appeal radio station the first guy in the country to do it and they didn't even want to shake my hand it was like okay good luck that on your follow up like what's doesn't that sound like, doesn't sound like those guys to me well you know them, I, I don't think they, they understood were fantastic I will tell you Bob it was early in their exposure to the mass market and I don't think they understood the role that programmers played in playing their music to get them the sales. I, I, oh. I just don't think they connected it. So they were completely indifferent. And, uh, you know, it was, it was just a very disappointing thing. I, I, I blamed more the record promoter than them. Somebody, the promoter, a, a Demers type guy, really should have said, hey, you need to shake this guy's hand. He put you on the map. But they dropped the ball. But not so much that I didn't put the record up on the wall. You know, the lead singer's name is Bart, so I had some affinity. Ah. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, you know, it's funny. When I, I did an interview back a few weeks ago with uh, with Mike Love, because they were coming into the uh, Oakdale, I think, on the 15th of December. And Mike was funny, because one of the first things he said when he started out, and I'll, I'll see if I can send it to you guys. One of the first things he said when he started out, he goes, I've been calling Hartford for years. He goes, maybe not 100 years. He says, but I've been calling hard for, for years. And I certainly remember Charlie Parker. And I said, how do you remember all these guys after all these years? He says, because they were the guys that made the difference. They were the guys that broke the records. These are these guys meant a lot. And um, and it's it's always been that way with him. He's uh, he's called. One time I laughed because my dad wasn't feeling well and he invited him to go to Russia with the Beach Boys. Um, they just always had a great connection. And Mike had a great sense of humor. And there's a lot of things, um, you know, let's face it. Uh, you know, with uh, Brian's dad, Murray, you know, Murray was a whack job, but they wouldn't have gotten to where they are without him. It's kind of like, you know, Joe Jackson with the Jackson five. These guys were nuts, but it really made a difference. When when 104 flipped alternative back in the mid 90s, all the bands came in. They were just thrilled to have their music played. So I don't know. I mean, Ed, I think I, when I was a kid, I met uh, I met Bruce Springsteen and Bruce was having a bad night and he was just rude. To everybody backstage and like holy cow you know you see a great performer and sometimes you don't want to meet your heroes i guess bob you must have let met a lot of well, them along the way no that's a good, really good point I, I met ringo once and everybody tells me how friendly and warm and approachable he is but i gotta tell you the night i caught him and talked with him backstage he was absolutely aloof and indifferent didn't want to have anything to do with us and it, it spoiled my uh experience with him so much that when I was in L.A., I had a chance to go to a private party with McCartney, and I didn't go because I didn't want to meet a guy that was so important in my life and led me to my career that I just, you know, it would be such a significant moment for me to meet this guy. And I would just be like, you know, a drip in a bucket of water kind of a thing to him. He's met so many people. And I was just I didn't want my bubble to be burst is bottom line. I wanted to keep him up on the pedestal. By the way, the same thing with Star Trek, guys. <laughs> I attended in L.A. the premiere of uh, The Wrath of Khan. And in the lobby, um, Shatner, Nimoy, uh, DeForest Kelly, uh, uh, Scotty, who, uh, uh, yeah, Duhan, they were all there in the lobby. And I was like four feet away from them. I could have walked up and you know, gushed like a Taylor fan or something, but I, I chose no, just it's enough to be here in the same room with them, kind of a deal. I just felt, you know, being here in Philly, there would be a lot of people in the soft rock era that would stop by the station and we'd either wind up doing an interview with them or spending some time. And one of the nicest guys that came up here was Barry Manilow, spent about an hour with him, put it on the air for about a half hour. Carly Simon would be up, Gordon Whitefoot. Uh, just endless. And plus we had the AM station, WPEM, which was adult standards. Tony Bennett would walk in 
unannounced, I mean, at any time, without any entourage, nobody accompany him. You just get into the elevator, come in and do interviews on the AM. People like, oh God, Patty Page, uh, and so on and so forth. The list is endless of those people that were more than happy to do a radio interview. I mean, this is late in their career on the PEN side, but on the WMGK side, these people were the ones that were you know, having these monstrous hits back in the late 70s and, and 80s. I was thinking about one thing when we were talking about record people, and I remember having a brief conversation one time with Phil Stebbin. Oh, God. And he was telling me about, and this applies pretty much to, I guess, most of the major top 40 stations that were significant in breaking records, and DRC was obviously one of them, and it may have even occurred at POP, I don't know. But this is long before the days of Sunday records by FedEx and what have you. And how, like in L.A., if the record was cut in L.A. and you wanted to get a Beatles song on the air, it was primarily with the Beatles and the Stones, that it would be shipped from an airplane. You would make contact with a flight attendant. And I guess you'd pay them a few bucks or whatever. And if the flight was going to L.A. to Hartford, Somebody in Hartford from the radio station would meet the flight attendant. Oh, yeah. And Phil Stebbin would tell me they'd run on down, throw it on the air at DRC to beat POP. And it was like that pretty much in, 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 in major markets that had a great influence on top 40 hits. So that was the way it was done back then in, in the mid-1960s. Oh, I can remember. I can remember um, uh, Merv Amos getting uh, calls at his house screaming at him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's really interesting because I remember my dad going down to Fairfield. I, we went with him one time and meeting somebody down there to get the record as it got off the plane. And then mm -hmm. when they bring it back, once they got it back, especially because it was, you know, battling with P.O.P. and stuff all over it. Every 30 seconds was big day exclusively. <laughs> so you couldn't record it. I remember and, hearing I remember hearing Jack Jones. A couple of years ago on Sirius XM talking about the song Strangers in the Night, how he went in and recorded the song. And then after he was done recording Strangers in the Night, which meant that he would have had the first, he had the first version and wound up going to have lunch uh, someplace in Los Angeles where there were record people there. And he said, boy, he said, I just recorded this great song called Strangers in the Night. And he was on the cap label at that time. And Sinatra, I guess, recently had recently sold off reprise to Warner Brothers. And they got wind of this record that Jack was raving about. And I, I don't think Cap had any, any notion of getting the record out there real fast. So the guys at, uh, at, at Reprise or Warner Brothers said, boy, he said, this song has got to be, I think it was from a movie called A Man Could Get Killed. So the song was out there. But they said, you know, maybe we ought to get Frank in the studio. He's in the studio now recording something. Let's get him to do this song, Strangers on the Night. And they did. And they felt that they had this really big hit on their hands. And they cut up about four or five acetates, got them out there to major radio stations. Jack Jones lost out. And Sinatra wound up with an enormous hit record. Yeah, that's how, that's how, that's how It's My Party came to be a Leslie Gore hit. Uh, they had produced it. Quincy Jones had produced it, and he caught wind that the Shirelles or some other group had to record it. We're going to get it out, so they burned it onto uh, some acetates, and that's what the stations were playing to break it before the uh, Shirelles or whoever the other group was could do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It was got a quick time. Jack. Got a quick Jack Jones story. Uh, I think Steve and maybe some of the other guys here were at a party at uh, Bill Hennessy's house. This was uh, this was essentially when Bob Ellsworth was uh, was uh, knew that his days were numbered, and Bill Hennessy essentially threw a uh, for better uh, for a better term a going away party oh, yeah. for, for Bob Ellsworth. Yep. And yep. Dick and Sally Robinson came over with their house guests for that weekend. Jack Jones. <laughs> <Yeah. and his laughs> wife. You know, Dick is great with a camera, but whenever he could grab a talent. He'll show up, you know, there's, he, he's making uh, spaghetti with Al Martino in the kitchen on the boat, but he'll always come up with somebody. He came in one time to uh, TIC and we were doing an interview with Dick and I don't know who it was, but it was somebody famous. And it's just like, 
<laughs> Dick would carry these guys around with him. Crack me up. Yeah, I remember. I remember that party. That's right, Bill Hennessy's house down at the beach. Yep. Hey, Ron, I know there's not a lot. You know, you I I know you never really get into it that much, and I bust your chops a lot about it. But in those early days when you were doing drumming with Alive and kicking and stuff, you got to go on like American Bandstand and some of that. What year were you doing that kind of stuff? And what was it when you were traveling with those guys when, you know, when they were so hot with the hit? 1970, Stephen, we were on American Bandstand. I remember we were, we were in the green room. And what they did in those days is they would tape like five or six shows on a Saturday. And it was a Saturday in Los Angeles. And we were in the green room with, this guy, and he looks over and he says, hey, how are you? I said, hey, how are you? He says, uh, you guys got a hit record? I said, yeah, we got a hit record. He says, oh, yeah, what's the name of your oh, yeah, group? Well, I've been kicking tighter, tighter. I said, who are you guys? He says, oh, we got a group called First Edition. I said, what's your name? Well, my name's Kenny. Kenny. Wow. <laughs> Kenny? Kenny who? Kenny Rogers. Oh, really? Well, good good luck, Kenny. Yeah, good luck to you. And of course, he went on to bigger and better things. But, yeah, we we did that show. And so Dick Hall, Dick Hall said, the Clark comes into the into the room and, you, you know, you don't realize when you see him on TV for you watch that. I watch that show all my life. Yep. And he walks in and I said, oh, who's this guy? I said, oh, my God, it's the Clark. <laughs> you know, and he says, hey, nicest guy, nicest guy. So we did that show. We did. A, there was a guy named Lloyd. I think Lloyd Thaxton. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Thaxton. He had, Thaxton. Yeah, he had yeah. a TV show. We did his show. Clay yep. Cole in New York. We did that show. In those days, you had all these you know, rock and roll, you know, Saturday weekend, weekday shows. And uh, we did a whole bunch of them and everything. And uh, that was, that was between March and September of 1970. That was our, that was our window. And then the right. second record came out and didn't do anything. And that was, we were one hit wonder group and that was the end of that. But uh, that was the greatest summer of my life. But how does that song election. held out? That song literally, it's Great still, song. It still works Tommy, when you hear it on Tommy the air James. today. Tommy oh, James yeah. was a. We would go into just Tommy James was an interesting guy. He would he had booked um, recording time from midnight to five a.m. several nights a week at a place called Allegro Sound Studios on I think it was Broadway in the fifties in Manhattan, and he had a specific engineer he would use, and he had musicians and whatnot. And he, our collect our our um, connection to him was. Our manager at the time, a woman named Doris Toder, her best friend was Tommy James' first wife. And he made it, we made a connection. We were playing in clubs in Brooklyn. He came to see us and he said, Hey, you guys are good. I'm going to write a song for you guys. And originally, this is a true story. Originally, he was going to give us Crystal Blue Persuasion. Oh, wow. And we said, Wow, what a great song. And then he said, No, no, I'm going to keep that for myself. But I wrote another song, and I think it's a pretty good song because you have two, we had two lead singers. We had Sandy, Sandy Toder was the girl, and, and Pepe Cardona was the guy Pepe sadly died a couple of years ago. And uh and he said, but I got a song for you. It's a it's a girl boy song. I think it'll work. And that was tighter tighter. And uh so we were going to the studio with him. He was a crazy guy and uh but he he took over a guy got screwed. Morris Levy just absolutely royally screwed him out of millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, Stole all his publishing and it was very, very sad. Did you but read his uh book? that did you read What's that? Book? Did you read his book? Yeah, I, I, Tommy James wrote a book about that. Yeah, yeah, and I didn't read it, but I know about it. Yeah, and Tommy book. is Tommy's still out there. He's still oh, yeah, he uh, he's still touring, and he does his show, his oldie shows. We had him at DRC Oldies but Goodies, those those the big D shows we had. We must have used him four or five times. And yeah, he's, uh, he's, on great. The, he's on the uh, he's on the uh, Sirius XM doing the uh, '60s channel. Uh, yeah. It's funny. I can remember being in Atlantic City and. I'm a lot younger than you are. I hate to break it to you. So That's probably, okay. <laughs> as, a 10, 11, as a 10, 11 year old kid and seen on the marquee alive and kicking in the five stair steps. You so, know where oh. he got his, you know where he got his, he got his group from Pittsburgh. Uh, they had a, he had, he made the hanky panky and hanky panky uh, in, right. in, in Cleveland and, right. and it became a hit and he had no band. It was years. Was, it was to Jim. It was two or three years after he yeah. recorded it. Just he sat goes on down, the shelf somewhere. He, there was a place called the Holiday House in Pittsburgh, and there was a a, a studio band, uh, a house band called uh, I don't know what they were called. And he wanted to find the Shondells that he didn't have, and he yeah. he took this band. They they seemed to work together. I guess one of the guys I met, uh, Mike Vale, who was one of the guitarists with the group, who was with them for years uh they went all over the country but he for, for a while it was just him 
I mean, even when you work with him, he may not have had the. Well, no, I met him in nineteen sixty-seven. Well, he did because he had. He used. He had like you yeah. say. And Mike Vale, his drummer was a guy named Russell. I met. I don't know his last name. I met him several times, but he had four or five musicians in the studio because he was a he was a genius in the studio. Yeah. You know, in those days, stereo was just breaking, and he knew how to use you know one channel to the next channel and it creates stereo. I mean, he had fifteen top ten records. I you met him about in, his in career. 1969 uh, at Rocky Point Amusement Park. I was working at WICE in Providence at the time. And I, for some, for some reason, I got a chance to MC this group, Tommy James and the Shondells at Rocky Point. And I went out there and they must have been stoned. I mean, they were nice, they were nice guys, but man, they were like in another world. It was like <laughs> everything was beautiful. And, um, <laughs> And that was and Ray that was, Stevens. <laughs> that's true. Crystal but, blue uh, persuasion. He was a genius. That's true. He still it. I mean, he just was. Yeah. But then you know, he just got screwed over. I remember me and my friend Bruce, Bruce Sedano, who was married to Donna Summer for thirty-two years. I don't know if you guys saw it, but there's a a, a, a video of him and his three daughters accepting, you know, posthumously for Donna the uh, the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Grammy Awards just a couple of weeks ago. If you get a chance on YouTube, Bruce Sedano, mm -hmm. who by the way just released a song with Valerie Simpson, has a band. He lives half the time in Italy and half the time in LA. And uh, he's still got a group and he opens up for the zombies. He tours with the zombies around the country and then he opens up for them because he's more of a singer songwriter. He's written songs for Dolly Parton, Michael Jackson, on and on and on. He's had a pretty good career besides being married to Donna. But um, we were once, we once went to um, Roulette Records and had to, and Morris Levy said, or his secretary said, Bring this to Tommy. It's his paycheck. He has to get it today. And we somehow were able to <laughs> take a look at it. And this is a 1969, oh. 1970. They were paying him $2,000 cash a week. And that was just basically his retainer, more wow. or less just a paycheck, not royalties or anything like that. So you know, he was making a lot of money. But even so, he got royally, royally screwed. Morris Levy took the, and this is a true story. He took the the, the uh, publishing, and he assigned it to his son, Aaron Levy, who at the time was 12 years old. Aaron Levy owned all of Tommy James's music. It was, it was, he was, it was, he was connected to the, the boys, though, wasn't oh, he? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, you yeah. didn't argue with him because, yeah. uh, well, it was yeah. not a smart... Well, I remember thing. we went to his studio, so we had the hit record, and we cut an album. The album didn't, didn't do anything, but we were, we were a pretty good group. I remember we went to his office... And uh, we're sitting there. There's this big, giant office. He's this guy with his big cigars behind his desk. And he said, what do you guys, you know, you guys had a great, great summer. You're doing great. What do you want? He says, well, Morris, we want more money. He says, you want money, do you? Okay. And he opens up his desk, <laughs> that's true, and he pulls out a document. You see this? This is the $30,000 that I had to pay for you to record that shitty album, which didn't sell anything. Who's paying me for this? Uh -oh. <laughs> now, here's what you guys ought to do. You got a hit record? Go out on the road and tour and make some money. Now, get out of here. Ron, are you, uh, do, you still have your, do you still have your legs? Uh, yeah. right. <laughs> really? Your kneecaps. I got, I, you know, somewhere kneecaps. I have a gold record, actually. You took him out of bed with his gold records. I have a gold record from that year. But... um. <laughs> it was it was a great it was a, I was 19 years old. It was a phenomenal time. Can you imagine if you got residuals it? for all no, the times no, that's been played on the radio? The we didn't write the song. I mean, just Tommy James would have gotten residuals. But I mean, every no, time that's is. played, it's you guys. Yeah, you, you know. So, yeah, so I was approached by a guy from um, Spotify a few years ago. We were at, we were at a uh, I was at a radio thing. A, a Hartford radio thing. And the guy said, I was talking to the guy. He said, oh, you were in that group? I said, yeah. He said, you know, you still got residuals. I said, how much would I get? He says, well, it's 0. 0. 0.00005 <laughs> cents per time. I said, but you ought to contact, um, oh, what's the name of that organization? That, that, uh, ASCAP, ASCAP? BMI or ASCAP? No, BMI. no, it's, it's something. Sound, 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 whatever it's, it's called. ASCAP, the one, BMI or sound, The sound. Uh, yeah, I know you're talking about exchange. exchange. Sound exchange. The sound yeah. exchange. Yeah. That's it. He said, you should contact them and see if there's any royalties you can pick up. I said, well, I didn't write the song. He said, well, you might still be entitled to something, but I don't know how much. And I, I never bought it. We didn't make any money. Let's Could have got way. a Clark bar for it or something, you know? It, it, it wouldn't have uh, it mattered to a hill of beans if you had a, how little they were paying. Hey, oh, what a great song. Some major though. artists what a, what a who don't great get song. any money. It was. Yeah. It was an exceptional I always, song. I would always say every it time I played is. it. <laughs> Every time I played it, I always say, here's a medley of their hit.
<laughs> right. I say that. Uh, you know, and after yeah, Morris and after Morris was dead, all those masters from Roulette were sold off to Rhino. I remember talking to yeah, this woman. Rhino. I uh, talked to this woman named Roz Kern. It's not funny. I remember her name all these years later. They were selling the publishing off to one group, and they were selling the master tapes off to Rhino at the time. If you hey, look, you the know, Rhino, the Rhino album, the Alive and Kickin' album by Rhino has the original album cover, but but in a smaller photo on the CD when they were when they released when it was all CDs. And I'm at the far left. We took that picture in the uh, with long hair water off of Huntington Beach in Los Angeles, and I'm on the far left with long hair, the, right? I had hair, didn't know. Yeah. I had long hair and hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, long, long time ago. I had a beard and the whole deal. Oh yeah, but, I uh, remember. We I went, remember oh God, a while back. Somebody, somebody posted on Facebook that they were they they were like a vinyl record collector, and they they specifically. We're looking for a vinyl copy of a lot of tighter, tighter. And, yeah, and I don't have one. And I said, you know, I know, I know the drummer and, and I'll, I'll ask him, but I don't even think he has it. <laughs> no, you know, I, my mother, you know, my mother had a few, a few copies, but I don't know what happened to them. You know, Ron, it proves that the, you had a hit song. I think you were number one, right? Number one. No, song. no, no. It was, it was, so if you remember back in those days, there were three recording. Cashbox, Billboard. Cashbox, Billboard, yeah. and R &R. Record World. Record, Record World, World was no, it? I Record think? World, yeah. R&R. &R. Right. Yeah. And we right. were, um, yeah, we were number three in Cashbox, number six uh in uh billboard and i forgot what we were in the other one never made number one but we were top five or top but like I, you know it, it, it's one of those like i said sustaining songs that they still yeah. play in oldie stations great song, today yeah. great and song. The thing i hear is, it all the time what, here it, what yeah. it proves is that you guys had the ability to make hit songs what it says to me is that levy didn't back you he decided no. for some <laughs> reason that no 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 these guys no that no i don't care they're getting big heads or something or I'm going to have to pay him too much money to hell with them. Or Tommy James maybe mm -hmm. wanted more money for, because he found you. And uh, it says that that's why you didn't have follow-ups. You know, I mean, you probably didn't have the same production quality on your other songs that you had in Alive and Kicking. I mean, the you know, tighter the and tighter. The truth is, if you were, if you, you look at the major star, major hit record makers, like a Paul Simon and guys like that, their first songs, they didn't have anything. You had to have some longevity. You had to have some follow-up success. That's why the term one hit wonder yeah. actually uh it, it, you know applies because we had one song, you know, which we didn't even write. We had it, we created an album. Our second record was was um so Tommy, so long story short, Tommy got all pissed off at us because we suddenly had a hit record and he really didn't expect that that was gonna happen. Hmm. So and we were we were we were kids, Calm. we were too big for our britches. So we, we, you know, we thought we were the world's greatest thing. So we, we needed it. So Morris Levy said, well, we know we got to get these guys another record. They're hot. So let's, let's get them going and get another record. So we had a second record. It was called Just Let It Come. Well, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, that was, and that was, and we, I remember it was played. I remember I was at the, I was at Collegiate Billiards, a pool hall in Brooklyn on Nostrand Avenue oh. on one Saturday night. And that song was played the one and only time on WABC. <laughs> and, you know, when we when we first broke Tighter Tighter, I remember Bruce and I, we were coming back from a job. We were playing club, with clubs in, in Brooklyn, New York. And we just, this record was finally getting started. And I remember we were driving, I was driving a, a car, he was driving the van full of our equipment. We were going back to my house to drop off all our equipment and then return the van to the rental place. And, uh, and we both had WMCA on or WABC and the song came on. Literally, we stopped. We got out of the cars. <laughs> we're jumping up and down because our song was finally being played on the radio. And uh, but the second record didn't do anything. I mean, it just I think it reached maybe top 50. I don't even think it reached top 50. You ever hear uh, about the theater. Sound of Silence? They recorded the first tracks and they didn't have any uh, orchestration behind it. And they literally thought they had a stiff. And they separated, and they one one of them went off to Europe, and another guy didn't did something else, was into teaching or something, and and then the producer took the master, a few months later without their permission, and added all of the production elements that made the sound of silence, what it was, you know, the the production value, the not just the guitars, and they they were surprised as anybody else when they came back and found out they had a hit song.
I used to I'll have tell you a something. When, Tom, when, when, when Tommy, when we first recorded, we came into the studio and recorded what we our parts. Drums, guitar, the singing. We had a really good, you know, the, the guys could sing. I wasn't a good singer, but Sandy, Bruce, a guy named Woody Wilson, uh, Johnny Parisio was the guitar player. He was a great guitar player. As a matter of fact, Tommy would bring him into the studio to use him on some of his records because he was such a funny, he was 17 at the time and he could play, we used to call him Eric. Like Eric Clapton, because that's how good this kid was. He's just playing the stoop on 28th Street in Brooklyn. But when we first heard the song, it was four minutes long and it was terrible. I said, This is this is the song he's given us. This is not going to be this. I said, that's too bad. It's not going to be a hit record. Two weeks later, we went back. He added horns. If you listen to that song, there's horns on it. There's a string section. It, it, it he it's amazing how he took this raw piece of data, whatever, you know, music and turns it into a hit record. That's how he, his, his genius, he just was phenomenal at, at uh, creating music. He was just phenomenal. And so to your point, that's exactly what Tommy James did with Tighter Tighter. You know, did getting, anybody getting, in your band, Ron, did anybody or have an interest in writing songs or were you just- Oh yeah, Bruce, play? yeah, they all did. Yeah, I wrote, did, did a little writing. Now I was not good, but Bruce Sinano, who, so the group broke up. So after the second record came out, the group broke up. Then some of the guys, I went back to school. I had one year of college left. I went back to school and I said, I don't want to be playing until three o'clock in the morning at clubs anymore. So we broke up. About a year later, Bruce went to Los City. He had a real career bent. He wanted to make it. So he went to California. This is 71, 72 now. Yeah. He went out to California. Remember, he was driving a florist truck as a delivering flor <laughs> floral arrangements in Los Angeles. But so he and a guy named uh, two other guys, Joe Esposito and and Eddie Hoganson started a group called Brooklyn Dreams. I don't know if anybody remember called Brooklyn Dreams, but they they had a they had a couple of hits and they were on TV. They did a, a lot of stuff and uh, they were signed. This comes back to the A and R guys. They were signed to a, a, a label called Casablanca Records. Yep. So one day Bruce is at you know you know timing and uh, and, and 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 being in the right place at the right time. So Bruce is at the record company one day sitting there and who walks in this lovely uh, African-American woman who apparently was touring all over Europe and uh, with the hair, with the, the, the traveling uh, troupe of hair and had a Good song genius. called Love to Love You Baby recorded by a very unknown, unknown <laughs> guy named Giorgio Moroder. Nobody knew at the time. Uh, and they had and they had this song. And they were Casablanca Records and they walk in. Bruce is there in the, in the, in the lobby and he meets Donna. Well, they were married for 32 years. But a bing. Yeah. Hey, Ted, you may know this, uh, speaking of Morris Levy, that uh, he was the guy who started Birdland. He owned Birdland. Oh, Jackson, yes. Yeah, you know, right. In New York. Yeah. yeah. I, I had been to Birdland only once or twice, but I spent a lot of time down in the lower village going to Village Vanguard, Village Gate. Uh, I you played know, at those and, places. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, those places were great. And uh, music was terrific. There was one bar on the, on the uh, east side just off of uh, Broadway, on uh, 50th Street, I think, or 52nd, there was like a, a the top hat bar or something like that. It was one of those typical storefront bars, long entryway, just a yeah. long bar. And they had a stage up behind the bar. So they had the booze bottles over here and they had the players guys in the middle of the racks of booze. And you could sit at the bar and just look up and listen to these guys playing jazz. And it was Fantastic! I just I got into jazz at that point. Really, is so. hey Jim, you were getting you were talking about the sounds of silence or silent mm -hmm. Garfunkel when the record started to break. Columbia issued a single. It was on red vinyl, and on one side was the acoustic version of Sounds of Silence, and the other side was the full orchestration, highly produced uh, uh, record to that. Uh, and and the the acoustic uh, version was. That was the first version. That was it. It was. Yeah. Yeah. It was on the album originally. The album, the album came out before the single. That was the Rosemary and Time. Uh, Parsley yeah. Saves, Parsley yeah, Saves Rosemary, Rosemary and Time. Time yeah. Album. Yeah. 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 Hey, Ron, what was the origin of the group's name, Alive and Kicking? Um, you know, that's a good question because <laughs> Bruce and I started playing together in 1964. I had a rented a rented drum. It wasn't even a set of drums from Sam Ash in Brooklyn, and Bruce was playing the accordion, and we played. And my mother belonged to it at this uh, swim club in Brooklyn in Canarsie, and she got us our first job, and we each made ten dollars. 
This is on a Saturday afternoon. A bunch of playing for a bunch of old ladies playing canasta. <laughs> it's a true story. <laughs> and and then we and then we started and we had various iterations. Uh, the Silent Souls, the Bats, the Fifth Prophecy. Um, we must have had six or seven groups, and then somehow we just morphed into Alive and Kick. And I maybe I don't know. I think Doris may have given us that name. She was our manager. So so Sandy Torrid, the lead singer's brother. This was his wife. She was crazy and knew nothing about managing a group and really didn't do anything for us other than get us in trouble. But, um, I, you know, that's that's what I remember. It was, it's, and by the way, it's not a live and kicking. It's a live N apostrophe kicking, K-I-C-K-I-N. And, and the kick. song, everybody says, we're tighter and tighter. No, no. Tighter, no. comma, mm -hmm. tighter. tighter. That was the name of the song. Not on the record on, labels. Not, not on the carts that I saw. No. <laughs> <laughs> I got news for you, buddy. You were alive and, <laughs> and kicking. kicking. <laughs> and the Wrong. song and was tighter and tighter. And, tighter. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was not. That's just true. Everybody got that wrong. You know, it's and funny. Because um, we got you, it wrong. You talk, about, you talk about all these people. Uh, Neil Diamond years ago went in and started writing his own music again. And that was because of Rick Rubin. And, of course, you know, Rick has produced some of the greatest oh. hip-hop. and so He's Jeez. a man. He can produce anything. And um, one of the songs that's on that album, on one of the versions of, of the album that they did, is a song called Delirious Love. And on, when, he, when he first sings it on the album, and I think you got to get, I think there's an extra couple of cuts on the other album. He, he sings it in the beginning by himself. And at the end of it, he does the same song with Brian Wilson doing harmony behind him. And it's wow. incredible. But here's a guy like Rick Rubin who said, hey, you got to start writing your own music again. And that you know made all the difference in the world. He's genius. Rick Rubin is. He's got a podcast. Um, I don't know if you guys know who Mark Marin is. He has oh, yeah. a podcast called WTF. He did a. I'm sorry, not Mark Marin. Um, oh yeah, my that, god, I can't that, think of his name now. That's who does the WTF. Is Mark Marin? Yeah, yeah. But there's. I'm, I'm thinking of something else. But anyway, there's a podcast out there. I, I'll think of the name of the of the guy. Um, Revisionist history. It's called. And. Um, uh, I can't think of the writer's name, but he does an interview with Rick Rubin. He just re released a book, Rick Rubin, about finding yourself and just being better, better at what you do, better person, and uh, you know, kind of a self help book. But uh, yeah, Rick Rubin is. Uh, look at those. I'm sure everybody's seen that Beatles anthology thing with uh, Jackson that he did. Yeah. Uh, you know, the eight hours. Yeah, you know, Rick Rubin is in that. I mean, he's. Uh, oh, there's a, a a story about Rick Rubin producing. We did something with Paul McCartney not yeah, too yeah. long ago. Yeah, that, yeah, that's on that's on video too, Ron, where they're sitting there yeah. with the math with the board with the master. I mean, with, and they right and going through every record. Yeah, and mixing the stuff in and taking it out and everything. Yeah, it's Malcolm so, Gladwell who does that podcast. Charles, yeah, right, yeah, right. That's right. Yeah, Ron, I got a question for you. When you first went into the studio, the very first day, you walked into the studio to record. Uh, did you have uh, butterflies? Were you I was scared shit? Intimidated by all the totally, totally yeah. scared and totally intimidated because I had not been actually I had been in the studios because we had cut several demos in you know studios yeah. in Brooklyn. When you go into a studio like that, you know, and it was below, it was down a basement, so you had to go down like two flights of stairs, and you walk in, and I had never seen a console like that. In those days, maybe it was eight tracks or maybe 16 tracks. I don't remember, but and now the guy's it's on the floor there. behind Tracy. <laughs> yeah, right. It, that's, you know, that's kind of what it looked like. I'll give you such a you deal. In, Ron, I had, I, I had a group that I managed back in 1968, and I was like 19. And we got, believe it or not, uh, there's a guy named Dennis Lambert who was a producer at Columbia. And he liked the demo that we did. We did a demo at Synchron Sound Studios in Wallingford. And so I, these guys were from south, southeastern Massachusetts. We drove them down. I got a van at like 3 in the morning, packed up all their gear, drove them down to Columbia Recording Studios on 46th Street. I was the manager, so I had to park the car. I had to make it. We, it, we got all the stuff into the studio. The bass guitarist was... 14 going on 15 and he walked into this was where Jackie Gleason's orchestra did his stuff and uh -huh. it, it's a it was a big studio yeah. brought him in and the kid choked everyone else could play, else could play. but the kid couldn't he 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 panicked 
And yeah. try as I may to get him to, to play, it didn't work. You know, and uh, so I ended up having to thank Denny. I, we, we never got another invitation to come down. Uh, we packed up the truck again and drove four hours back to southeastern Massachusetts. And that was the end of that. But they had done a great demo when they didn't feel like they had anything on the line. The kid was relaxed. But when all of a sudden he was in, you know, you walk into this big studio like you did, you know, you were probably a little older, so you probably had a, a little more. Uh, I was 19. Well, well, the, much what, I, what I recall, again, it's 50, you know, it's 54, it's 55. We, we recorded that song in December of 1969 and it was released in, in, right after the first of the year, like February, March. I really didn't really didn't become a hit until May because it was a real summer song. Yeah. But I remember what I do remember is walking in and you'd go into the sit behind it. Behind, most of the studios had already had drums in place. You just use the drums that they had. You didn't, I didn't have to bring my drums. And I sat, remember sitting behind there and you're behind, you know, these panels, yep. soundproof panels. because everything yep. was, everybody was away from each other and everything was also very muted. So they were like the drums sounded very muted and everything because that's the way they recorded things. And I was out of my element. I was not used to that at all. So it took some time. And then being intimidated, Tommy James is not the easiest guy to work with. You know, he, you know, he, he's sitting in the in the in the studio in the other studio behind the glass. And if he did something wrong, he didn't like. We say, "Oh, stop, 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 stop. Do it again. Do it again." And we would have to, you know, you just, everything would stop. I'd have to start all over again. He was a taskmaster. That, that, you know, those are my recollections, but I was I was scared. But then as time went on, you know, you got better, and then we'd stop, we'd break, and we'd go inside, we'd, you know, have some coffee or a cigarette or something like that, whatever, and you'd feel more comfortable, and you go back out and do some more. But you, you know? played on it when you played on American Bandstand. I mean, shit, you had to be. You don't play. That's all. Yeah. That was all. Uh, oh, okay. That was all. We didn't even play the song. <laughs> okay. That was hey. all. Uh, that's all lip, lip synced. Hey, right. um, just I, only because it, it is 60 years um, uh, since the Beatles arrival. And I really, really wanted to, if for those of you who haven't checked with Ed Bruders on the OBG, WDRC OBG.com site, Ed, that is an amazing interview with Long John Wade. Could you kind of just tell people about that? Because that's unbelievable for people who haven't heard about him traveling with the Beatles all those weeks. Could And if you go to WDRC OBG.com and read the, 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 uh, the interview with uh, Long John, it's amazing. Can you um, tell us a little bit about that, Ed? Yeah, well, Long John was working at DRC and his brother Don was doing weekends there. And um, the opportunity came up to travel with the Beatles on their entire 1964 summer tour. And I guess John went to your father and said, what do you think? And we pull it off. And he brought it to, uh, was it Bill Crawford was manager oh, there? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. Crawford said, how can we make money on it? And I guess they decided on if they could sell the reports to five other radio stations somewhere in the country that would offset the cost of John's airfare and hotel and whatnot. So they did that. I guess they sold it to more than that. It was more like a dozen stations when it was said and done. And they traveled the whole tour and sent back like two or three reports a day. And Don Wade filled in for Long John during his shift during that three and a half weeks or whatever that that length of time was. But the stories that he told, I mean, pillow fights with the Beatles. I mean, it was crazy. And he's got, of course, that cartoon you have up there with Paul McCartney did a cartoon of John, Long John. I mean, he drew a cartoon of him. Yeah, he talked about how John Lennon punched him in the mouth one time. <laughs> punched, punched Long John in the mouth. Um, I guess he had said something in one of the reports that that uh, Lennon didn't like. So he hauled off and popped him one. But it was it was pretty interesting stuff. And, and, and he still had all those memories. Of course, Long John had had a stroke and um, he ended up having to get out of radio and he moved back to a family cottage in, on Cape Cod. And he used to get up and do morning drive as a listener because he would listen to his brother, Don, at LS in Chicago, who was doing morning drive. And he would critique the show and call him afterwards and suggest guests and whatnot. So he was still active, but his voice was gone by that time. I told you guys, guys once before about he coming up to the radio station in Philly uh, when I was programming WMGK, and it was really very, very sad because he was, this is before he moved up to the Cape, he had a broadcasting school like Robinson did in Philly, and uh, he, he wanted me to do some teaching, yada, yada, but when he came up to the station, he brought this bag, the shopping bag that had those reels of tape that had the interviews with him, and he wanted me to listen to them, he wanted me to hire him. 
to do a show in the morning. And he was just, I just knew he wasn't up for the task to do a morning show. He's very unstable. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I'll, you know, I'll listen to them or whatever. And I brought him back to him, the tapes to him back at the school when I did one session there, one session teaching at his school. And I'll never forget, he greeted me at the door when I was about to teach. And he started talking to me totally in an English accent, a brilliant <laughs> English accent, like he, you know, was from Britain. Somebody, and that's all he did the whole evening was talk in a British accent. Very strange guy. What, what a good jock. What a, a great mind. Very intelligent guy. Yeah, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia when he was in Philly. And his broadcast school um, went out of business. And there were some lawsuits involved for non-payment of staff and tuition refunds and that kind of thing. And um, he went for treatment several different times to various hospitals and clinics around the country. Um, John was a, a licensed firearms instructor with the NRA as early as 1963 when he started at DRC. In fact, Sandy Beach, when he was there for the DRC reunion a couple of summers ago, recollected that he and some of the other jocks, Robinson and Long John, would go out into the tower field sometimes and do target practice. <laughs> because, of course, it was a pretty rural area then. It wasn't built up as much as it is now. But John was a, a, a very talented guy with some unique haunts. Yeah, he showed up at, and I don't know if Ron Pell was there or not, but I do remember that he did show up at DRC at 869 Blue Hills one time. Yeah, he just walked in, I guess, from what I understand. Yeah, Wayne, Wayne told me I that. I don't remember. I don't remember Wayne that, said Steve. that he wanted him to go out in, into his car or truck, whatever he had, uh, and, and he opened it up and it had a cache of weapons in it. He said, look yes. at all these babies. And Wayne said, I wanted to get out of there as quick as I could. <laughs> Didn't he get nailed somewhere in Philadelphia for guns or something? Or I don't he know. He did. He never got convicted of anything, but um, the firearms came into it when he was arrested in connection with the um, the school closing. <laughs> a, a dick brown type situation ed yeah, yeah dick brown was another character he never worked at the drc but no ed and i both worked at a station in in new hampshire where um this guy dick brown he he was a little bit wacky and um he he shot he shot a uh he took a shot in the production room and uh, the, the the bullet hole was still in the wall for, for, many, <laughs> for many years. It may still be there because uh, when we were back for the 90th uh, anniversary, the, the, they still had that old uh, uh, acoustic tile with the holes, with all the holes in it. And so one of those holes was not made by the uh, uh, tile manufacturer. Dick Brown <laughs> did work, though, at WPOP in 1959 and 60. He was the morning uh -huh. guy for about a year. Oh, wow. He started his first show by calling himself Dick um, Rockefeller. <laughs> uh, not, not Rockefeller, Ribicoff, after the senator of Connecticut. <laughs> yeah, Ribicoff. And I guess that was the, the first complaint people made against him was making fun of the senator. By the way, the, the, the Beatles that you're talking about, the Beatles uh, tour, and they they played, they went to New York and then they played, um, they played in Miami at the, <laughs> at the, the Deauville Hotel. My grandparents were in the audience. They were not there to see the Beatles. In Collins <laughs> Avenue, I remember that rip place. Yeah, they, Collins they, Avenue. Yeah, they it, it they just tore it down last year or the year before. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was the they were there on vacation at the Deauville Hotel, and the Ed Sullivan Show was was being broadcast live from from the ballroom in the hotel, and the Beatles were on the were on the on the show, but they were they were there to see Myron Cohen and Mitzi Gaynor. Right. Do you remember the year that the Beatles uh, played Shea Stadium? Sixty-four. They played it. Uh, they played it in sixty-five and sixty-six. 65. And I actually, uh, Bertha Porter got tickets, and I was with my dad and my sister and Bertha. And for my eleventh birthday, I got to see the Beatles at Shea Stadium. Wow. Well, I lived about. Uh, I lived in in Queens in Flushing, about probably maybe fifteen minutes away, ten minutes away from uh, from Shea Stadium, from Flushing Meadows Park. And I was, that's when I was going down uh, uh, at night to go to the jazz clubs and village and stuff. And I remember driving past on the LIE going down into, into New York, into Manhattan at night when they started. And from the roadway, you could hear the screaming of everybody <laughs> and the lights were flaring. You could hear screaming from the roadway. And this is probably about eight o'clock, nine o'clock. And then I'm down, I'm, I'm finish up down there, and I come back and, after midnight, and you still hear the screaming going on. Like, so they had a soundtrack of just screaming young women the whole time for hours at a time. The place was all lit up. It was amazing. 
Yeah, I remember in 66, it was strange because I could still, when everybody, once everybody was in the stadium and the show was about to start, the Beatles actually pulled up next to the stadium outdoors. Yeah. And they were like waving and they were kind I don't know if there were street signs or whatever it was, but they were screwing around because everybody was already locked inside the stadium. And it was like something out of the movie Help or Hard Day's Night or something. It was They were just clowning around. The uh, I, I, I emceed, uh, no, I was a guest. Beach Boy concert, Dillon Stadium, nineteen seventy two. Yep. And my was my wife was a new bride, and I took her to the concert because I got free tickets. And uh, so we're backstage, and they're leaving the stadium in an open uh, limousine, a convertible, and they're reaching back and they're talking to these young ladies yep. and pulling him into the car. And my wife is going, <laughs> what, "What are they doing?" I said they're fans. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they were, you know, um, she knows better now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there was some, there was definitely, uh, they were wild. In fact, even after all those years when they got uh, got off the, I, when they pulled in first in the bus, they had, um, they said something like, uh, you know, Mike got off. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah. I was wondering if you and your dad were going to be here. He really did. He really uh, did remember. And I think, you know, when you when you go back to these guys and, and like yeah. you mentioned, Long John traveling with the Beatles, they actually cut and Orson has them somewhere. But they actually cut Christmas greetings just uh, to, for DRC to say, you know, Merry Christmas, Hartford and all this stuff. And, you know, they did all kinds of stuff like that back then. And do they, they still uh, exist, those t the Christmas greetings from DRC? Yes, they do. And Orson has them. Yeah. Oh. Now, can he get his hands on him? I don't know. But I will say when we did the show together at P.O.P. in the 90s, we did play him. So he brought him in. In fact, I think he still had him on cart and uh, he brought him in then. But uh, he, I think he had transferred him or something at some point in time. to, to cart. For several years, the Beatles, the Beatles used to do a Christmas greeting for their fan club and they pressed it on vinyl and sent it out or sold it. I don't know what they did. Did they mention they, the they call sent it to the members of their fan club? Yeah. Did they mention the call letters of DRC when they did the greeting? You know something? I would have to check with Dave. I, 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 <clears throat> excuse me, I have a funny feeling maybe not. I don't know because I kind of was pretty careful on what I played on POP. So um, I don't know if the call letters were on there or not. Do you remember the uh, Sooner or Later by the Grassroots? And yes. they, they would sing, yeah. uh, the Grassroots sang WDRC yes. Sooner or Later. And it was the group. It wasn't, I know that somebody went on, maybe it was Joey who went on later and started doing that as a, like a business. But they had the a thing group, called Mingles. Yeah. The thing about that, though, the, it, it was the grassroots who did it. They actually, it was a promotional. We played there, it. There, there, were, there were a number of those, though. I mean, I remember uh, uh, TIC had a custom by, I think, Donna Summer, my mm -hmm. TIC music machine. There were, there were a number of uh, customs like that later in the years. The yeah, thing KB that was interesting, Buffalo though, had a series of those too. The thing that was interesting is I think that was like that was seventy two. It was like it was very unusual uh, when sooner or later came out. Was that seventy two or seventy one? So uh, seventy one. It, it took everybody by surprise. Oh wow! Listen to that. That's Rob Brill. Uh, he's doing the vocal for DRC. You know, got to play that more, more times. You know, and it was um, it was impressive. No, I, I, Donna Summer, I never heard, but I believe you, you know. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, another great edition of Radio Friends again uh, for the 16th of February. And um, hopefully uh, we'll get together uh, next week on the 23rd of February for another edition. Thanks a lot, guys. And uh, we'll see you next week. You're a friend. You're a friend. Has got a lot to share.